So, 15 years ago, um, I was living in Jackson, Michigan with my wife, Taryn, and we heard of this church called Mars Hill. And um, we had visited once or twice and uh, found out about this person, and his name is Rob Bell, and just really enjoyed what he was saying. And in a sense, it felt like he was giving us language for what I think many of us were feeling. Um, and then he wrote this book, and we started reading it here and ingesting it, and again, gave us more language for what we wanted Watershed to be when we started Watershed almost 15 years ago. Um, and so, it, 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 I don't need to introduce Rob Bell. Most of us have uh, learned deeply and drank deeply from the well of his experiences and his writings. And so, Watershed, I would like to introduce to you uh, our friend, feels like a Watershed person, Rob Bell. <laughs> a watershed person. Yes. So you're on the so West, you're on the West Coast, 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 Coast. How are you and your family doing? doing? Uh, we are 10 days into the ultimate social distancing, <laughs> self-isolation, quarantine. Um, and uh, these are surreal times. So uh, we're doing, we're doing, we're experiencing everything like everybody else all the feeling we're feeling all the feels yeah right. yeah right oh man i we are as well we are as well we're a little yeah. behind you in that so i think we're we're starting to hit it full on as well yeah um so we have these we have children who are now home from school we have um you guys had to kill the house for me we have children at home from school we have uh, you know parents who thought well man now i'm a single parent i gotta figure out what to do with my children and then a few days later, they weren't working, or they were maybe sent home from work. Um, and this, this virus is creating a lot of um, anxiety, a lot of stress, um, a lot of the unknown. Is there, maybe if I could invite you to put your pastoral hat on and just say, all right, what, what would you say to your, your watershed people? What would you say that would maybe be a salve on our sort of stressed out souls right now? Oh, man. To all my watershed friends, <laughs> uh, I would say whatever you are feeling is totally normal. So uh, I'm lots of miles away and we're like Zoom digital, so it's all strange, but we are together at, at, at some level. Um, and we're experiencing this like full spectrum of the human experience. So uh, panic, panic about health, panic about uh, finances, um, a sense of odd uh, gratitude that you're with the people that you mm -hmm. love. Um, so all of these things right now are sitting side by side. Maybe you're just furious with the president and the horrific incompetence we have witnessed. So let's put that in there. Uh, maybe you had all sorts of things planned, uh, meaningful, enjoyable, significant things planned that are now gone. Like your calendar is just big open spaces looking ahead. Um, and that's, that's really, really important is to allow yourself just to feel all that. And sometimes you're feeling it in the same hour and sometimes you're feeling two completely different things, right, Scott? And yeah, yeah. within like a couple of minutes of each other, yeah. you're angry, frightened, claustrophobic. Um, <laughs> yes, yes. And, and uh, so that's really, really important. We're all in this together and every way that you find yourself responding in the looping on any given day and with any 10 minute span. Yeah. From, from the bell family to you, we know exactly what <laughs> you're talking about, let alone sadness. And I mean, there's like a growing death toll. So there's, there's a grieving for human life. And then we don't know where this is headed, which is really important to note because the modern age was built on the conquering of mystery. Mm. It was built on figuring it all out. But we as a people, we don't, there is an unknown to this. Uh, so even Scott, you gathering people even this way is just to sit together in the unknown. 
and that's an incredible, that's incredibly important um, right now hmm. is we don't know where we're headed, but we're headed there together. And by together, we don't just mean like watershed and me and Los Angeles um, and America. We mean the world is going somewhere yeah. we haven't been before. And the modern world was so much about mastery, but this, um, there is a mystery to this experience we're having that, uh, that we walk together into the unknown. Mm -hmm. Thank you for, Thank those, you for words. those words. Those, those, those are, are uh, deeply, uh, deeply meaningful, meaningful and, so and so necessary. Um, um, so, so I, I, I want to move, move away, away from, from the, the, the virus, virus conversation, conversation. Not, because not because it's not necessary, necessary but we're, we're hearing, hearing it all the time. All the time. And, yeah, and maybe, maybe kind of go down, down a different, different place. place. So, so what I'm, what I'm, what I've, what I've, what we've tried to do, to do is organize, organize this morning in such a way, way that, that I don't want to hold you back. You if back. you feel if like you want to riff on something, something, you go. You go. Um, oh, I will. Um, <laughs> okay, <laughs> awesome. Uh, and, um, and, and the other side and is, other side I've, is tried I've, I've tried to throw a couple of questions your way that I think are relevant to our people that we can maybe hear from you personally. So. I, I know you're keenly aware of this deconstruction, reconstruction conversation, which I think sometimes is helpful and sometimes it's not helpful. Uh, we've been using different language, like well, uh, language of reclamation. What's it mean to reclaim some of the things that for many of us were very important to us for decades? What many of us have done, we've thrown the baby out with the bathwater. We've said no to sort of all of it, and now all we do is go to yoga or go to the woods and call it a day. So what is it, and I'm a fan of yoga, I'm a fan of the woods. But what does it mean for us to reclaim has been some language of late. And so I know your journey has been, uh, and I've heard you speak of it, I've heard you tell of it, um, has been difficult because in your deconstruction, reconstruction, reclamation, whatever language you want to use, your journey, um, it's impacted your relationships. That there are people that did not want to move along in that journey with you. Um, and there are people that said, yeah, man, let's, let's charge the hill. Um, I know for many of our folks at Watershed, Thanksgiving dinner is a hard place to sit sometimes. It used to be a unified narrative. It's, not, that's not, it's no longer that way. Um, could you speak into that? Could you maybe share what that's meant for you? And what would you say to our people in terms of how do we engage people that don't, uh, don't appreciate the, maybe the, the shifts that we've made? Yeah, yeah. Well, there's a, there's a question. Um, <laughs> once you see you can't unsee mm. and once you taste you can't untaste mm -hmm. so, so you come from a people and those people those settings systems tribes organizations institutions they have their codes their rules sometimes they're written sometimes they're unwritten there is the way we do things in this family this system this office this market this a religious system, whatever it is. So from a young age, we pick this all up because we're very intuitive creatures. We pick up how it works. So in many ways, it's like you're given a set of, a pair of glasses that are the lens through which you see the world. But then you keep going and you see beyond that lens. You see more. Um, you see things that don't fit in that particular story you, you bump into these things called facts <laughs> you uh encounter people who weren't conditioned according to the same set of assumptions and expectations and rules and you either deny those experiences of truth goodness beauty life spirit the divine or you integrate them and if you integrate them you will expand mm. and by the way the universe has been expanding for 13 billion years yeah. So when you find yourself thinking everything is just bigger than it used to be, or I just can't fit in that narrow space anymore. Yeah, of course, of mm -hmm. course. The universe has been expanding for 13 billion years. This whole cosmos around us has been <gasps> becoming more expansive. Yeah. So when that happens to you, of course that happens to you. And what often happens is there are people around you who haven't seen what you've seen and they haven't tasted what you've tasted uh so so first off it's important you can't take people where they don't want to go mm -hmm. you can't uh and it's hard to show somebody something who doesn't want to see it because the old world worked for you at some point at some point it was fine um and now it doesn't 
so there's like a like a restlessness of the soul like a claustrophobia of the spirit which is like i can't do that anymore yeah so you have to keep going this is why uh in pretty much every tradition the saints mystics gurus sages um they they often walk with a limp um they often walk with a limp because you had to keep going um, pretty much every literature across every time period, every story that involves some sort of hero's journey and involves a leaving uh, of home and headed into the unknown. You know what I mean? This is yeah, like, yes. this is universal. So uh, it's important. You can ask, you can ask, answer questions, but sometimes people get incredibly their enlightenment becomes an obstacle to others enlightenment mm -hmm. they're they're so happy to be liberated they're shoving their liberation in the face of others mm -hmm. um, it's probably best to just to walk humbly mm -hmm. and with some relationships you have to have less contact with some uh you just have to decide i'm not going to apologize or defend um this is my path i'm mm -hmm. walking it but many people weren't taught this because the institution is not going to teach you about your evolving maturity and consciousness. It's not going to say, Hey, you might keep going. That's not good for donations. So most <laughs> right. systems are devoted to their self-preservation. Yeah. Um, yeah. Other narratives become threatening and subversive. Mm -hmm. But, but if you like, if you read the gospels, this is what's happening again and again and again is Jesus is inviting people to a more expanded understanding of truth, and love and justice. And it's inherently disruptive and yeah, yeah. that's central to how spirit works. So this is a very ancient thing that's happening in these very modern times. Man, it's, it's, it's good when you share this with us and yet it's still so hard. Because in the end, the, the carnage is often relationship, right? The carnage are loved ones. What is one of the most dominant questions in the New Testament? One of the most dominant questions is, who is my family? Because uh -huh. what spiritual growth instantly does is challenge the biological bonds. Because it simply says... Uh, something new is happening and you are invited to participate in it. Um, and so you're kind and gracious and loving, but you also have to follow it because it's where the life is. Um, and that's one of the most, it appears to be simple. I would say it's one of the more elegant questions you can ask is simply, where is the life? Where is, where is, where's is life? Oh yeah. Cause all of it, we have a deep, deep soul, radar for these sorts of mm -hmm. things like oh it's that way yeah we got to follow it that way okay let's go that way as a community as a family as yeah, yeah. individuals um you know because you know you know this area there's this ancient hebrew idea of a wide space and a narrow space <laughs> and the divine movement in the world leads you out of that cramped narrow mm -hmm. claustrophobic space into a wide expansive free space. And this happens intellectually. This happens psychologically. This happens in our bodies. Our bodies are keeping score the whole time. Our bodies know. Not that, that. Yeah. Uh, it's, 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 it's been, been interesting, interesting to watch the narrative of our people, many of whom they, they start breaking down their faith journey and it translates to every other area. Uh, be, because the faith journey, ideally, the, the, we've been taught that God is the ultimate narrative that you hold to and then everything else is sub to that. So once God, the, the narrative of God breaks down, um, your political worldview changes, how you see economics, how you see systems and infrastructure, right? So I'll, I'll take you back to a, a book, your, one of your first books, Velvet Elvis, and um, we've, we've <laughs> it's old school. Cool. So, so, you know, here, you know, he wrote, here, he wrote, he wrote this thing 15, 15 years, years ago or so, and we use this book as a, as a kind of a, a foundational tool in a group, a small group that we offer called Preface. And for six weeks, 40 of us get together five times a year, and we do sort of a self-discovery uh, evolutionary narrative through that process that helps us understand why we're making these new shifts and what's going on in all of it. All that to say, 
the first chapter where you talk about the bricks in the springs is probably some of the some of the the best metaphor to help people understand what they're feeling would you do two things for me would you summarize what the bricks and the springs are for those that don't know what we're talking about a la chapter one but the question i have for you today is if you were writing that book today would would that metaphor still work if not would there be something that you would change or add to that Ah, oh, that's really interesting um yeah, that, that um, for many people, the way that they were taught how the world works is a, a foundational system. Basically, how is the furniture in your brain organized about how the world works? And for many people, the system they were given, sort of undergirded by the God stuff, mm -hmm. um, is that there is this wall of bricks. There are all these things that are true. And if you mess with one of those things then the whole wall mm. collapses, mm -hmm. that everything has to stay in perfectly the same space. So uh, like you all are a church, this will be people coming from religion. So if, if you talk about the creation of the world or the Bible, Jesus, God, uh, how we become better people, whatever it is, if you, if you tweak one of those, pull out one of those bricks, the whole thing collapses, mm -hmm. which um, creates there's a sort of uh, intellectual death to that because you can't go, you can't go looking, you can't go searching. And this particular Jesus tradition that comes out of the Hebrew tradition is built around questions. Questions are the highest questions are how the whole thing works. A question is rooted in humility. A question is rooted in wonder and mystery. A question has a dynamism to it. It's a participatory energetic I got questions here. So basically every, every one of you who's like, I'm just filled with questions. Of course you are. That's how it works. That's how it works. Yeah. The Bible is a book of people learning to ask really good questions. Um, and then you get answers and those answers lead you to more questions. So there's bricks, which is question this one belief, this one doctrine, this one doc dogma, and the whole wall collapses. Mm -hmm. So it appears to be very strong, but it's actually very, very fragile. Mm -hmm. uh, in the book I talk about, Think, seeing things more in terms of like springs on a trampoline. You can take out springs and you can still jump. Um, so how you construct the world and how you see it is a, is a more evolving process and experience in which there are things that at one time you relied on and you realize, oh, um, I don't have to rely on that. Let's move from, let's say, religion to like life um, perhaps at one point for you, the most important thing about your work was what job makes the most amount of money. So you went and did that. And then a couple years in, maybe you were like, wait a second. There was like this existential thud in your heart. Like there's got to be something more important than just making the most amount of money. Well, that's swapping out a spring right there. That's saying what I do each day should have other things than just how much money it produces. So that's, what happens then over the course of life is you're swapping these different springs out because you're growing and you're learning and it's supposed to be this enjoyable and yeah, interesting. Yeah. That's how the whole thing works. And of course there's struggle and sweat and all that stuff involved. Right, right. Yeah. 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 Of course. Wow. wow. So, so would, what would you, would you add anything to that narrative 15 years later? Oh, man. Oh, man. Oh, man. That's a great question. I'd have to go back and think about 35-year-old Rob Bell. <laughs> All, right. All right. Well, let me ask well, you this question like, then, Rob. Here's yeah. my question. Here's what I would say. 35-year-old Rob Bell was still trying to make sense of better religion. Yeah, right. Was, yeah, still, right. Trying, was still trying to make religion better and more palatable. Um, this Rob Bell, quarantine Rob Bell, talking to Watershed Rob Bell, um, would be far less interested, would be much more interested in how the, those ideas and beliefs work. What do they yeah. do yeah. in everyday life? So every person, all of you Watershed, who are the whole thing's up in the air because you're like, I can't go back and do that, but I don't quite know how to go forward. The divine resides within you. The Christ says, I am you, you and me. There, there is a deep intuitive wisdom of the cosmos 
the Christ in you. Mm-hmm. So as you make your way in the world, the danger is that people swap out fundamentalisms. This is why when you meet somebody who's really like, I'm an atheist, and you find out, I just always ask us, what Baptist church did you grow up in? Because <laughs> oftentimes the, it's just replacing one fundamentalism with another. Oh, or you even see like- the word progressive. You meet somebody who just have, has to let you know they're a progressive. Mm-hmm. Well, so just tell me what tradition you came from that was too stifling yeah. that you needed to swap out. They've swapped out words, but the spirit and the beliefs are still held the same mm-hmm. way. So you can have very different beliefs or statements about politics or religion or you know, relational dynamics, but it's held with the same rigidity. Mm-hmm. Um, which doesn't actually, the growth is you learning that you know, you know when the life force is flowing through you, you know when you're becoming more open and generous, you know when you're building the musculature to forgive people, you you know when you're growing in courage and bravery, you know all these things, you know what I mean? We know these things. And so one of the the, the reasons why a community is so beautiful is there is an authoritative community that says, here's how to do it. And then there's a whole nother kind of community where you're holding mirrors up to each other. Oh, great metaphor. So the one person is saying, just tell me what to do. Mm-hmm. No, I'm going to hold a mirror up to you. And I'm going to help you reflect on what you do know. And if we together sit in what you've already said about your life, we'll discover that you know exactly what to do next. Yeah. So like we hold these mirrors up to each other because we're all learning how to navigate this. Well, excellent, Ron. Uh, good, good. Thank you. Uh, so, so it leads me to my next question. Kind of my, the question I've been kind of wanting, and this is where, like we said at the top of the hour, <laughs> yeah. right? All right. I, I want you to feel I, I the want you to feel really, 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 said really, really. So, said earlier. So here's the question that I, that I have for you. What, you know, obviously you're reading stuff and you, you're, you're listening to things and you're ingesting content and you're spending time with people that are, are pouring into you. What would you say if you go back over the last 18 months, maybe 24 months have been the biggest shifts or the biggest learnings that you've experienced that that are helping you maybe click forward a little bit? Oh my word. Oh, it's general. It never stops. Yeah. So I feel, I feel younger and more curious and more filled with wonder and awe than ever. Mm. Um, and um, more fierce and more. What do you mean open. by that? What do you mean by um, fierce? You discover certain things really matter. Mm. Also, I'll meet somebody who hates their job. Yeah. Uh, no, no. We're all going to die. Who knows? How soon? Not even this virus, just life itself. It's too short to hate your job. It's too short. It's, there's, there's too much heart and soul and life in you to wake up in the morning and give your energies to something that you despise. So whether it's a new spirit that you go into that same work or we talk about making changes. So that's what I mean by fierce is, um, or, uh, you get these, like we have three kids, Chris and I have three kids. Um, it's the best. I just love it. I just love them. I love being with them. Um, there's this loss and tragedy and a, a mounting death toll. And we're all in quarantine. We don't know where this whole thing is headed, but I'm in my house with my kids. Um, we're on day 10 and it's, the best even though it's also like we're all up, like at any moment about to go crazy but you're also <laughs> so, so like to parents um so that's what i mean by fierce is this you have these these kids what a gift what a gift what a you know what i mean what a <laughs> gift um what's your question again oh 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 uh Learned. this world that we're living in this culture um, is created, it got created. And we are living according to assumptions and rules that were constructed and fabricated. 
and your growth into greater peace, joy, and love comes with every degree to which you can identify, oh, wait, that's a rule that somebody came up with. I don't have to follow that. I can work under a tree in my backyard if I want. Yeah. Um, my kids and the rules about what you're supposed to do for your kids. No, Billy Eilish was homeschooled. End of discussion. You know what I mean? Like <laughs> you can, there are lots and lots of ways to do this. And I meet more and more people who are like, well, my parents told us, my editor said, my boss said, I got a bunch of coworkers, um, your spiritual, your growth into greater satisfaction and joy will come as you challenge those narratives. I know they're saying this is how it's done. Yeah. Uh, is there some other way to do it? That, that we, we create, we co-create this reality. And every system of authority that's told you this is how it is, somebody just said that. Now, it had, may have some wisdom in it. It could have been grounded in all sorts of truths that are immutable at some level. But this thing is way more pliable. It's, the clay is way wetter than anybody realizes. It's more flexible. It's more limber than anybody realizes. Wow. That's what I keep learning over and over and over and over again. Um, wow. So, um, I mean, that, that, talk about a, a, a salve over our soul. That's, that's good to yeah. hear. Cause I think, it, most, I think it, go ahead. Oh yeah. Most of the people that I interact with, they have a voice on their shoulder mm. telling them, uh, how it's supposed to be done. Mm. So, so for example, a writer who's like, well, uh, my book needs to be 60,000 words. Why? <laughs> Why? The great art, uh, many people think the greatest American architect ever was Louis Kahn. And Louis Kahn, before he would design a building, he would ask, what does this building want to be? So mm. That was the question. What does this building want mm. to be? So that is essentially locating the impelling force what is within this particular project that we're just going to help it come out? So think about kids. What does this kid want to be? Whatever you do with that kid, don't put that kid in club sports. <laughs> Whatever you do with that kid, don't make that kid feel shame because they aren't good at geometry. You know what I mean? Put a yeah. piece of clay in that kid's hand and that kid can make things with their yeah. hand. You know what I mean? Yeah. Don't give that kid a shame complex that they're not good at chemistry. Um, what does this marriage want yeah. to be? What does this business want to be? Uh, and that's a completely different set of questions than, well, this is just how it's done. And pretty much everybody that I interact with, there's anytime somebody's stuck, the first thing we do in spiritual direction is we go looking for, What's the voice on the shoulder um, telling them this is how it's done? And then we go, wait, 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 what does this, whatever it is, want to be? Because usually it's already talking to you. The kid's already telling you. Yeah. The work's already telling you the truth. It's been wow. telling you the truth the whole time. What does watershed want to be? Who cares? Mm. Like other churches, fine, whatever. What does watershed mm. want to be? Um, and that's just a completely wow. different discussion than I guess we're supposed to have. Why? Why? Says who? <laughs> do it that way. <laughs> wow. That, yeah. It, it, well, I think probably some of, some of the work that you've done for us that has been so core to who we are has been the question asking, where mm. uh, it felt like for the first 12, 13 years, all we did was ask questions or let people yeah. sit with the question. Yeah. And I don't know if it's a second half of life narrative. Um, I don't know if it's what you were speaking about a few moments ago, but there's this sense that while we still are asking hard questions, we're beginning to say, well, let's give the answers that we do currently know to be true. And Absolutely. they will probably shift, Absolutely. but let's live with them. And that's the thing about, you mentioned deconstruction is people are like, I'm just all about the questions. Fantastic. Here's the thing. If you ask questions, you're actually going to get answers. Mm -hmm. You're actually going to get answers. <laughs> Interesting. Yeah. And that's part of it. So it's not just an endless 
foggy, like, man, I'm just like, I just got a lot of, no, no, you'll get answers. So you'll quickly see that everything is spiritual. Um, we'll quickly see that, that the American health system is one of the worst in the developing world. Like you'll get answers. The way that we think about economics is a scarcity mindset that makes everybody miserable and needs a complete restructuring all the way to, like you'll, you'll get answers um, and they'll be true. And you'll be able to orient yourself around them and go in new directions. That's all part of it. Yeah. So that makes sense that you all would realize, hey, certain things work over time. Certain things are really good for us. Yeah. Certain things, um, grieving is a part of life. And ungrieved grief. This is why when somebody famous dies and we're really moved and we're like, but I didn't even like her albums or whatever it was. You know what I mean? Um, <laughs> yeah. Probably because the public grief over that person exposed ungrieved grief that each of us are carrying around. So a community that has time where you simply just grieve, anybody got anything to grieve? Mm. And you discover, oh, my bones have been storing sadness because that relationship didn't go the way I wanted yeah. it to. Or uh, grief that that thing that I had so much anticipation about, it became something else. So there are things that you discover. Grief is a part of life. And the expression, the full expression of grief is absolutely necessary for health and vitality. There are things that you actually learn. And then you can build practices and around those things because you know things. That's what I mean by being fierce is we know that everybody learning how to forgive everybody for everything is absolutely central it's not for the advanced players it's for yeah. everybody if you don't learn to forgive life will quickly become smaller and smaller and smaller and all the joy will be choked out of it yeah wow i could Very see us using that, that fierce language here coming up um in our community so thank you for that I, so I have, a, I have a couple of quick questions and, and then um I'll, I'll let you go but i, I wanted we have a relatively young community and um uh, we're, we're gently aging, but relatively young. And so how old were you when you started Mars Hill? Oh my goodness. That was another life. Uh, 28. Okay. So if you could. 22 years ago, 21 years ago. Yeah. Okay. So I think you used to talk about escaping to the sound booth or wherever it was between services. Mm. So if you could escape back to that sound booth again. Yeah, there, was like, oh, there, was a, there was a storage closet. Storage closet. <laughs> All the better. <laughs> okay. That I would like go in between services to like sort of catch my breath. Mm. All right. So it was difficult. I'd go in there and I'd have my car key and think I started this church, but it's become like a giant machine. How far away could I be <laughs> my car by the next service, which I wasn't laughing at the time, but <laughs> I'm laughing now. <laughs> well, so here's my question then. What would you, so if you could go back to that 27, 28 year old young man and whisper something in his ear, what would it be? I'd whisper presence, mm. presence. N knowledge is nice mm. and facts are nice. And putting on a show for people is nice. Mm. But presence, like you and I, watershed people mm. being together right now. Uh, that the first and greatest gift that we give each other yeah. is we're present with each other. Yeah. Um, so everybody, like everybody who's watching this, if you're, if you, if you got some love, some loves around you, <laughs> um, yeah, take a look at those people. Um, yeah, this is, we're all going through this giant thing together right now in 2020. We did not think 2020 was going to start like this. Um, we don't know what we're headed into, what loss, grief, what fundamental restructuring of life as we know it is about to happen. But look around you, look, presence. You have these flesh and blood explosions of life called your family and friends that you're going through with it. Yeah. yeah. So they didn't just now fix it. They didn't alter the future in any way, and yet it changes everything when we're present. So I would have leaned over and said to that dude who was running a hundred miles an hour, running this giant spiritual machine, 
trying to save the world, um, I would have been like, hey, do less, just do way less, but be fully present mm -hmm. in what you are doing. And that'll be worth 10,000 times, which is an interesting experiment um, I've been doing recently. Because if I would say to everybody right now, because some people have floated around that we're going to be in quarantine till July or August. Mm -hmm. Now, that's just been thrown out there. Yeah. That's not coming from me. I hear that and I go Apple rainbow death wheel, right? My screen, <laughs> right? You know what I mean? Oh, yes. You know? And if you have kids under the age of five and you're like, oh, no, you're in quarantine till August. No, just, just no. Um, but my brain can't even handle the idea that this situation we've been in for 10 days will extend through the summer. But every one of us would say that we want to be more fully present, like fully present in our bodies, yeah. um, to the ones that we love. Every parent says, I don't want to miss a thing. Uh, yeah. So all of us to a T would say, I don't want to miss out on my life. I don't want to slide across the surface of my existence. I want to feel it and yeah. be fully present. So, so this thing, um, how long are we going to be in social distancing, whatever, whatever, um, that I just lock up. I, I get, that's terrifying, but already 10 days in what my family, we keep talking about is the only way to do this is to wake up each morning and be like, well, we have today. Yeah. Cause if you, if you even go a couple of days ahead, you're like, yeah. you know what I mean? I'm burning through the Netflix. Yes. You know what I, mean? yes. Um, I literally started reading a novel yesterday that was like this thick just because I was like, if I get into this, man, there's a good couple of days. Yeah. <laughs> um, so presence, that's what I would have said to that guy. I would have said, you're running 100 miles an hour. You're try trying to do all of this stuff. But the the real mojo of life is being fully present right here right now that's a good word to hear so i got one last question and we're asking this question of all our interviewees and um as we are approaching easter and maybe you kind of just hit on it in, in the moments earlier but what would you say resurrection means to you these days oh oh so i mean that the story is never over even when it's over. Mm. <laughs> so be very careful about the judgments you place on stories because what may look to be dead mm. um, may rise again in a whole new way that you did not see coming. And some things need to die. Some whole ways of viewing the world need to die some ways of arranging our communal life our political life our economic life together some things may need to die and you let them let them because then you can have a resurrection and that works at the meta that works at the political communal that's also true at the the personal we're endlessly all of us going through this process of some things are dying it's okay because some new things want to come to life so it's this ancient story about a movement of people around this itinerant, subversive rabbi who they kept insisting there's a whole new order. There's the order of Caesar, which is peace through violence. And then there's this new way to order the world, to order ourselves, not around violence and greed and dominance, but around sacrificial love, around solidarity, around being present to each other by caring for the most vulnerable in our midst. That's how you actually make a new world. Yeah. Um, so resurrection is a more potent, dangerous, extraordinary world changing idea than ever. Oh yeah. <laughs> Bring it on. <laughs> Amazing. Thank you so much, Rob. I, I can't tell you how much it's meant to share yeah. our morning with you. Um, there are a lot of friends that you have here in Charlotte, North Carolina, mm -hmm. and I guarantee you, you made some more this morning. Oh. So thank you for just uh, giving us your time, being up at seven o'clock, waiting for us here on the West, on the East Coast. And, no um, worries. 
just thank you for the work you do. Uh, please know it. I know you know this, but you're reminded it does not fall on deaf ears, and it mm. it leads it leads to changing relationships, changing marriages, changing community mm. connection, how people see reality. Mm. Um, so again, grateful for you, grateful for the work you do, mm. and uh, I, I hope I hope we can do this again in the relative near future. Well, I think we're all going to be close to our screens if we need to be. <laughs> I'm honored. It's just I'm I'm just beyond honored, and um, it's really it was really great to talk with you and. Um, from my family here in Los Angeles, where the sun has just come up, um, we're sending you grace and peace and love now, now, <laughs> yeah. more than ever. Thank you, Rob. I appreciate it. And I, uh, we will learn the, the, the presence piece very, very intensely in the days ahead. So thank you. Yeah. For yeah. All right. All right. We're grateful for you.